Okay. So first of all, thank you all for being here. It's so late. It's the second day. Uh, we've listened to so many great uh, slides. So first of all, I want to, to apologize for the number of repetitions of things that you have already learned today, but appear also in this slide. So sorry for that, but it's one of the challenges of being one of the last uh, <laughs> uh, speakers. So my name is Anais and today I'm going to present uh, uh, well, a survey on Starks. Uh, this is a summary of an internship that I developed at Kedit uh, and I'm a PhD student at IMS, uh, the India uh, Software Institute in Madrid. I want to thank La Caixa Foundation for funding my PhD studies and CK for inviting me to this event. So what are we going to do today? So first we're going to do an introduction to proofs. I think nothing that you don't know about, sorry. Uh, then I will uh, show you how to build a Stark. Uh, then we will check some of the available libraries and we'll look at some experiments that we've developed. So first of all, um, Let's look at some of the, well, the model that we're looking at. So most of you must be uh, maybe familiar with this kind of uh, graph, the MPP uh, problem. So basically uh, P problems are like the easy problems, the, like multiplication. Uh, we hope that factorization is a harder problem. This allows us for doing something like public key crypto. That's fine for cryptographers. And then we have plenty of other more complex uh, problems. And the idea of this slide is just to say that in Starks you can do more complex uh, statements. Okay? So, well, SNARKs uh, stands for, uh, for succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge. But this talk is about something that is quite similar, at least uh, the suffix is the same, which is Starks. In this case, this S uh, stands for scalable and the T for transparent. We will see what it means in a minute. And yeah, so we are looking at these cryptographic beasts and we learn how to tame them. So but don't be afraid if you find some Harry Potter references throughout the talk. Uh, voila, and this is the first one of them. So here we have Newt's commander. For those who don't know, this guy is a magician. And uh, he's claiming that some computation, this computation she, uh, in t t steps on public input x and on witness, this is a secret w, outputs y. Okay, this is just notation. But anyway, this guy is claiming that this thing is true. Okay, thank you. So he's claiming that this thing is true, and here you have Kowalski, he's a muggle. Uh, so he cannot uh, do it, he cannot. Uh, try to make it himself to, to check uh, if this thing is true. So how can we do a proof out of this? Well, we have these interactive proofs where basically uh, Kowalski, uh, the verifier, will send challenges which are essentially like questions and the magician, the, the prover, uh, will send answers to those challenges and in a number of rounds, because this is interactive, the prover will mathematically, let's say, uh, convince the verifier that this uh, statement is in fact true. So the verifier can check this. So there are plenty of ways to do this. We have interactive oracle proofs, IOPs, uh, where essentially uh, the verifier is given oracle access, meaning that the answers that he receives are PCPs. This is basically like a very structured kind of answer and the verifier will look at just some query points, not the whole thing, but we won't go to the details of this. Um, but this is something we really don't like because in, on the internet, on the blockchain, we don't really like interactive things. Uh, so nodes are connected from time to time. You really don't want this interactiveness with other nodes and other pieces of, of software all over the world, but instead you want non-interactiveness. Uh, but this simply doesn't work, so the, the, this, we are all muggles here, so this simply doesn't work. You cannot have this magical, uh, mag well, this magician, this wizard doing some crazy trick and then we will be all convinced that this, uh, that this guy has magic. But instead, we need to rely on some other primitives. Uh, like the, well, we need the random oracle model. So this guy will be our random oracle. I uh, don't know if you watched the film, but this guy can see the future. 
so this is quite a good reference. So essentially what this guy will do is to simulate this interactiveness. So basically the prover will ask this guy uh, some, 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 some queries. Uh, this, this guy is a hash function. So we'll ask on a random point, we'll get some output, and then the verifier will ask the same uh, questions to this guy to get the same kind of uh, results. So they can simulate this interactiveness by relying on, 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 the, on this guy, essentially. So uh, this is, well, I don't know if you've been looking at this part, but we are building some, uh, yeah, some, some constructions. This is Nairop. So, or Nirop, I know, don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, okay, but now we're going to the to stick. So essentially what has happened here, now this guy is transparent. And uh, yeah, in the film, this guy becomes invisible, so nice. Uh, so essentially what this means is that the verifier, all that the verifier will do will be public coin, meaning that all the randomness that he will be using is public knowledge. It, there's, no, there's nothing fishy going on here. Uh, so this is what transparent means, then the scalable part. So in the scalable part, we're saying that the, ver that the, that the prover will run in quasi-linear time uh, in the size, in the length of the statement, and the verifier will be polylog, meaning that if it's too uh, time-consuming for the verifier, then it's not, I mean, don't even bother to do all this protocol. Yes? Uh, what does T mean? T, T, what did it say? T transparent? No. Where, what T? Uh, this T? Uh, T is a subscript of, uh, superscript of, T, of C. Oh. This, this transp... No. C of T. C of T. Oh, sorry. Okay, okay. I was looking at this T. Okay, okay. No, this means... So you have a computation that in a number of T steps in time. Hi. Okay. Yes. So it's a, a bound on the time. Output Y, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So... Here, this we have a stick, and then, mm, voila, you have a Stark. This is an instantiation of a stick, and basically, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but the only difference between this slide and this other slide is that I removed the one from this, uh, from the wizard, meaning that this guy won't have infinite power. Otherwise, he could uh, create uh, false uh, claims. Okay, so this is a Stark. We're done, right? No, no, we are not done. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so we want to answer uh, this question, how to create a Stark? So I guess you didn't read my abstract for this talk because I submitted it a bit late. So, but in the abstract, I was saying that I, will, that I would be uh, expecting some basic notions on cooking from the audience. So I really hope that you know how to answer the following question. So how to create a Stark? Well, I assume that you all know how to fry an egg. Because I realized while studying about Starks that creating a Stark is essentially the same, it follows the same steps as frying an egg. Yes, I know, I know. So let's get to it. Like, really? How so? That paper is horrible. How can it be as simple as frying an egg? We'll see why. So what do you need to fry an egg? You need an egg, right? Yeah, okay, you brought your skills, cool. So you need your egg. So what do you do next? Well, you have to crack it. So you crack the egg, and at some point of time, your egg is in the air, okay? It falls from the air, okay? Kind of, okay. So what's the next thing that you need? Of course. A frying pan. Yes, you need the aluminum pan. And then what do you do next? And then, of course, you need some heat. So you need to extend the temperature, which has low degree at the beginning. Okay, yes. And then what do you need do next? Of course, you fry your egg. Okay, yeah, so this is how you can build a Stark. So essentially, you have your problem, you convert it to some constraints, you have a compiler, you need to do some crazy interpolations, and then you get a proof. So why did I leave this annoying white space here? I left that space for optimizations. So how can you make your whole procedure of frying an egg more optimal? There are two ways of doing this, okay? First of all, what if your egg has two yolks, huh? a pair of yolks? This is awesome. And what is the other way that you can improve this procedure? So 
suppose you uh, open the egg and then you have these crunchy things. So you have to approve that this egg is fine, okay? So these are just optimizations. They are not considered in the library that we've been using, so I won't, I won't be talking about them. Uh, but essentially, you start with a claim on a certain computation, you convert that claim uh, to a claim about polynomials, and then you finish on a claim on the low degreeness of those polynomials. Okay, let's see what this means. So, first, the error. This is the skill step. I mean, who of you didn't break a yolk while frying an egg? If, if you break the yolk, then that, 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 no, the whole procedure will, will, be, will be run. So this is a real skilled step, and this is a manual step. So I'm sorry for that, but if you want to build a stack for a certain computation, you have to do this process manually, sorry. So what's the, what's the error? So essentially, you start with your, this is arithmetic intermediate representation. So you start with an initial value, and then you have a claimed value at the end, after two steps. Uh, so you're saying, you start with this, uh, with this value, after two steps, the computation will output this, other value. So what we are also going to build is a transition function, this polynomial. So this polynomial uh, on input a certain point of time, the i step, will output the, 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 well, the, 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 the value of the computation in that step of time. And then we are also going to build this constraint polynomial, we call it q. And I mean, it's basically you, you simply put this a in this place, you put a minus, I mean, this is just, this is just notation. So we essentially, we're essentially uh, uh, representing the transition function. So meaning the polynomial that goes from this egg to this other egg and so and so. And the constraint polynomial, which is essentially the same, but gets a zero here, okay? So you're getting one of these uh, things for all of the variables in your computation. So you will end up with a matrix. This is the execution trace. Uh, which will have as many columns as the width of your state and as many rows as the time. So depending on, so depending on, the, on the number of steps that are required by your computation, this is the matrix. And for each of these main, uh, I mean, and for each of these columns, you're going to have the P and the Q, the P and the Q for each of them. Okay? Now, a bit more technical, we're going to be working over a finite field, uh, meaning these are not like just integer numbers, but they are modular numbers, let's say. Uh, so they are not like any infinite number, but they are bounded. So you cannot have any uh, arbitrarily large number represented here. At some point you go to the beginning again. So, and the, okay, so this means that this x will be some numbers in that final field. And a bit more, so for efficiency, those polynomials will be defined over a group. So what's a group? So a group, you can define a group over this finite field uh, by, by a bunch of elements. So in this case, you have eight elements, these blue balls. And it's, so t is eight in this case, such that you can find g, this is a generator, this is just a number and a field element, such that by multiplying this element by g, uh, you, you end up with a cycle. So you start from G, you, you, you exponentiate G eight times, in, eight times in this case, and then you'll eventually go back to one. Okay, so this is, this is a cyclic group, and we need to define our polynomials over this group, meaning that essentially we're just rewriting this notation, so instead of putting here the i-th position, we put the G to the i-th. Okay, this is just notation, we don't care about this. Okay. So, Ali, this means more polynomials. So essentially, we want to prove that all this execution trace is satisfied. And we're going to do this splitting into two steps. First of all, that the boundary constraints, meaning the initial and the final value are, well, they hold, and that all, everything in the beginning, in the, in, in the intermediate steps, hold as well, okay? So how we do this, this is for the boundary constraints. Uh, we will prove that this thing is divisible by this thing. Okay, but what's this thing? So this p polynomial is the same polynomial that we were talking about. This is the polynomial representing your computation. So on the first, on the first, uh, the initial step it has this value. In the following step it has this value, and in the final step it has this other value. Okay, 
What's this i uh, polynomial? Well, this i polynomial is the smallest polynomial that passes through this number and this number. So you have two points, you want to have a polynomial that passes through this point and this point. So what you have is a line. So you have this line. Okay. okay. So you have this line that passes through this point and this point. This is i of x. Then you subtract. So when you subtract to this, this wavy polynomial, this value, it will be zero here and zero here and some other thing in between. So you have this p minus one. And then since this p minus one is zero here and zero here, it will be divisible. It will be a um, uh, multiple of the smallest polynomial z, z, sorry, that is zero here and here, meaning a parabola, this parabola here. Okay. And so then you can build b and b will be, well, we, we, we have b to check that this, that p is uh, the claim value in the initial value and in the final value. Now we're going to check everything in between. So for that, we have something similar. We have q of x. q of x, if you remember correctly, it was the same p of x, but it has it had zeros in, the, in all the, the, the execution uh, points. And then we have z. So we want to make sure that the q is divisible by z. So z is the smallest point that passes through zero in all those points. So essentially the same, okay? This is what we want to do. But then how we can do this? So this is where the low degree extension comes in. And this is a bottleneck because it implies, it requires plenty of interpolations and multi-point uh, evaluations. And these are quasi-linear, these procedures. So this is why um, Starks are quasi-linear and I mean, th this, this is something that if you improve this part, then Starks will be more, 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 more um, faster than they are. Okay, so essentially you end up with some polynomials and many others, as you've seen, and they are defined over these, uh, these group elements, these blue points. But in fact, we want to check that these polynomials are divisible by the zero polynomial, but you want to check that in other points because otherwise they are not defined. So essentially we want to prove by, we want to prove that uh, they are, that they are, um, that they are multiples of the zero polynomial. And we want to do that by evaluating on some intermediate points, these points in between. Yes. Um, when you say that LD is uh, linear, do you mean that the proving is linear or the... the no, quasi-linear, quasi I mean, uh, the, the prover, the prover, prover. yep. Because of the FFT and yeah. Lagrange, and, okay. Okay, so how can we get these intermediate points? Uh, we have to extend our group. So basically, we before we used to have this group of eight elements, and now we want to find out what are these intermediate points, the blue, the blue ones. And we essentially do the same thing. We want to find another generator. In this case, it's gamma, such that if you multiply gamma uh, sequentially by itself, you'll end up to zero again. So you, you will notice that gamma to the four equals our original, our original G and, and so forth. Okay. So essentially now we end up with a domain that is uh, four times larger. This is the extension factor, but it, uh, it allows us to uh, query on these points. Okay, and now we go to the fry. This is the last step. And this is the new technique that is proposed in the Stark paper. All of the other things that we've seen before existed before. Okay, but still these are, you, you're going to find very, you're going to be very familiar with these techniques as well. So essentially what's the prover going to do? So basically you're going to build plenty of Merkel trees, plenty of them during this uh, step, okay? So first of all, <coughs> the prover will build a Merkel tree uh, with the witness. So essentially the execution trace and some other secrets. And that's what is going to put inside the leaves. Okay, so in the i leaf, you have the evaluation of these things, okay? And so with the, with the root of this polynomial, you're, use, you're going to use the root uh, to, to get a random linear combination of all of the other polynomials that we've talked about, meaning the B, the P, the Q, the, all of that, okay? So you have E evaluations. This is E, our initial four. This can be any number, well, any. 
uh, times t, okay? So this is linear in the number of steps of your initial computation. You have this many number of evaluations, meaning this many number of leaves here, okay? So, yeah, this is what's inside the i-th leaf. Okay, so you end up with uh, the evaluations of a polynomial that has degree t times mu minus 1. This mu is the maximum constraint of each of the columns of the execution trace that we were talking about before. So, if you think naively, if you have a number of, so how many numbers, you, how many evaluations do you need, evalu polynomial evaluations do you need to, to, to know what's the, um, what's, the, the, what's the polynomial that passes through all these points? So you need, uh, if this thing has degree d, you, have, you need degree d plus one point. And then, as you can see, this, uh, this is larger than t, the initial t, the initial uh, number of steps that you wanted to avoid from the beginning. So this, and th this approach is not really good enough. Uh, so instead, we are going to do some kind of FFT-ish thing, okay? So essentially, if you have a function, your polynomial, this can be our linear combination that we have been talking about, you can always split it into two polynomials this way. So here you have the even uh, coefficients, th this part, and then here you have the odd coefficients, and then you're evaluating x here and x squared here. Meaning that this f even and f odd, has, uh, they, they have uh, half the degree of the initial uh, polynomial, okay? So at each step of this thing, you're reducing the degree of this polynomial uh, by, by, um, by halving it. Okay, so in this case, uh, by doing these things, you can have a fry that is linear in the prover and look at it for the, for, the, for the verifier. But how can does it work? Well, in reality, we are not going to split it into two, but in four, because there are some heuristics and they found that dividing by four was more efficient. So essentially we have here our leaves and we are going to split them into four e equal parts and we're essentially going to build like a matrix. So this part will go here, this part will go here. I mean, we're just moving things around. Okay, so these are the evaluations of the, of the linear combination. So we initially had E of them. So now we have four rows and E divided by four, nothing weird going on here. And we're going to do the same for the, for the domain over which the linear combination was defined, okay? This is like your y and this is like your x, if you think about functions this way. Okay, so you, you have all these numbers. So we're, what we're going to do, we're going to build Lagrange polynomials. So for each of these columns, you're going to build a polynomial of degree three, such that the evaluation of this polynomial on this particular point is going it is well equals this other guy okay so this same polynomial evaluated on this point will output this one okay simple so we are doing like a linear combination of the linear combination that we had before okay so what can we do with this essentially as i said we build one for each uh, column in this matrix and then using this guy, the root of the initial uh, Merkle tree for the, of the linear combination, we're going to ask this guy, hey, give me a random point, it gives us this x, and we're going to evaluate all of these polynomials on this x. So when you evaluate these polynomials on this x, you're en you, will, you will end up with another uh, set of leaves and a Merkle tree, which has four times uh, less um, leaves that you initially had. Okay, so I think you're kind of getting the idea here. So you're going to repeat it until you end up with a constant polynomial, until you have very little leaves here, okay, or until you want to, yeah, I mean, this is heuristic, so sometimes you want to finish before, but that's it. So you're, you will end when you find a, a sufficiently small polynomial. So this is the commit phase, but what's the verifier going to do? So the verifier will ask, uh, well, will ask this guy, the, trans the, the, the oracle guy, hey, what's the point that, where you, that was used to build all this crazy thing? And he'll say, okay, it's X. And, and then, uh, thanks, to, thanks to this, uh, the verifier will be able to rebuild uh, at each step in time, 
the, the initial uh, polynomial that was used, okay? So essentially, uh, you get the Lagrange of this guy, you know the value, you know what were the, the other uh, four points that were used in the upper level, and then you will start uh, rebuilding uh, until you, well, from, from the constant polynomial to the, where, to the big, I mean, to the largest uh, set of uh, leaves. So at the end, well, this is what I said, uh, you know what, are, what were the four that were used, blah, 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 blah. And essentially at the end, you will check that the leaves that the prover uh, sent to you uh, are consistent on, with what, you, what the verifier is computing on his side. Okay? I don't want to be very technical here, but this is the idea of what's the fry doing. Okay? So now we're going to look at some experiments that we've developed. So these are some of the implementations of Starks. This one is written in JavaScript. This one is C or C++, can't remember. And this one is Rust. So for some reasons, I mean, uh, we, we were looking at this one because we, we thought that for the time of the internship, it could be more suitable to understand and to analyze. So this is what we are going to look at. So all the results that we're showing now uh, refer to this uh, library here. Okay, so we analyzed this for the case of Pedersen commitments. I mean, it, this is not a Pedersen hash, this is not like super complex things, this is just a Pedersen commitment, we use them all, all the time. So what's a Pedersen commitment? The Pedersen commitment is something like this, we have a number 8, we uh, uh, exponentiate it uh, to R, we have another number g, we exponentiate it to the message m, we multiply these things together and this magically has this property. So essentially this is the same, mathematically speaking, as having a, well you receive the Hogwarts letter uh, and then when you receive your Hogwarts letter and then you open it, you know that whatever you find in this letter was in fact what Albus Dumbledore was sending to you. So if you find that you have to go to Hogwarts, you know that you actually have to go to Hogwarts, okay? That's the that's thing. You, you, there was no way that a muggle in between could change it. No, no way, no way. This is, not, this is not a joke. You are actually going to Hogwarts. But anyway, so this is not the way to do it. You, see, you, you want to have a logarithmic number of rows. What other things are a bit tricky, okay? You at least need two columns, one for the 8 and one for the G. But hey, you also have this multiplication in between, so do you actually need like a third column just to check this thing at the end or can you be more efficient than this? And by the way, uh, do they need to be the exact same number of steps? Because this thing, this guy could be, I mean, one bit less than this other guy. So, you know, if, if they are not the same size, you need to increase the, the degree of the constraint and this is painful. Okay, but anyway, as you can see, even a simple example uh, is a headache, okay? Uh, and now we're going to look at some theoretical complexity. So basically, uh, the number of repetitions that you have to perform in your Fry protocol, uh, if lambda is the number of bits of security that you want to achieve, is logarithmic in the size of the, of the evaluation domain uh, divided by the degree of the polynomial. Uh, okay, doesn't matter. So essentially, the prover is quasi-linear, kind of. So, I mean, we are, we are going to publish like a tutorial on how to build a Stark and you'll find a huge table on the concrete uh, costs of this library and it's much worse than this, but this is just, okay. Otherwise, it wouldn't fit the, the slides, so that's why. Uh, this is, okay, the quasi-linear prover, the polylogarithmic verifier, polylogarithmic proof size as well and linear uh, size of the Merkle trees in, in this, again, in the, in the, in the length of the, of the computation. But this is kind of unfriendly, so let's, let's check some, some numbers. So, uh, okay, we, we did this experiment, and this is why we need uh, some, some standardization on benchmarking, because I really had no idea of what to, of what to, 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 to well, what, what things I could uh, benchmark, in fact. So I came up with this idea. So for instance, if, if you have your, um, your blockchain, suppose you have 2 to the 32 leaves, so in order to verify 
all of the Pedersen, I mean, suppose you have Pedersen commitments here. In order to verify all of them, you will need 32 commitments to verify only this thing. Uh, we are working with a 256-bit field size, 256-bit in the exponent, and what we are getting is 15-second prover, 2-second verifier, this is huge, 700-kilobyte uh, proof, 600-kilobyte Merkle trees and 200 megabytes of RAM, okay? So I don't know how familiar you are with this. Uh, I'm more in the theoretical side, so not really sure that these numbers are good or not. But what I'm sure about is that these numbers are really not desirable. So in order to prove 124 commitments, so for instance, some of the commitments that will be in those leaves, for a 32-bit field size, this is really small, and 256-bit exponent, this is the same, you end up with a 200-second prover. This is huge. I mean, this is three minutes and something. Verifier, okay, the verifier is not that bad. You have a two megabyte proof, not very good. You have 500 kilobyte trace, but what, what's really annoying is this three gigabytes of RAM, okay? Um, you normally don't have this machine. And this is not surprising either, because in the paper they also they, they speak about the machine that they are using and they're using something like 700 gigabyte uh, RAM machine or something like that. It's a huge machine. So this is not shocking, but still, um, yeah, I mean, we, we didn't like to find this. So, okay. And then another trade-off that we found is that for this particular example, of course, these are, these are all or, uh, heuristics, it's way better to have more columns than, than rows, okay? So if that's useful for you, great. Uh, but then I want to answer to this question. So in, in fact, what we wanted to do is to compare Starks with Snarks, but I'm afraid that this is a next to Apple's comparison, uh, because, and you'll see why in a minute. So we compared this uh, amateur library, the GenStark, with, uh, yeah, with Libra's Zcash. So, so Libra, uh, Libra's Zcash is this uh, orange graph, this is the prover, and this is uh, the, the results that we got from the GenStark. So, okay, why is this an X to apples? Because we are only working over a finite field. This is just a finite field. Uh, 256 bit, but here they are using jab jab elliptic curves and plenty of crazy maths. So, if this Stark is way worse than the Snark and it and it's using so simple mathematics, uh, then it's not very clear how we can improve this library to be uh, com comparable to to this one. Okay, so should we put our coins here? If you're an enterprise, maybe you want to have an answer for this. And well, my answer is that uh, never put all eggs in one basket, okay? So again, going back to your uh, cooking abilities, what else do you need to fry an egg? You need oil. Yeah, so did you bring your oil? Any other inquiry left? I'll be happy to answer, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, surely there is a question. Yeah. Sorry to hug all the questions. Uh, Did you try uh, any other um, circuit benchmarks than the um, commitments? The pacing commitments? Uh, no, so all of the benchmark was about the commitments. Uh, well, I mean, we also have some. Um, Example some Fibonacci sequence and this kind of toy uh, things to understand what was going on, but no. So we, in fact, we wanted to have like a larger uh, use case. We wanted to prove that uh, some transactions, a bunch of transactions, uh, are uh, in the are in the um, in the blockchain. So, but of course, the tr uh, transaction is not only about one person commitment whatsoever, it's way more complex. So that was our goal and we had to stop before because at least with this library it was, I mean, we couldn't even think about it. So in order to do a more complete benchmark we will go to another library. 
probably the holder we would like to check that. Okay. The problem about the holder is that it was released uh, right after finishing uh, the, P in the, the internship, so quite inconvenient, but now I want to go back to StarX and Aurora and, and try to get more numbers. Yeah, I, I know Stark were, have been working on the hash functions, so they're more okay. efficient for air, so that, that might be the next thing to try. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone? Yes. <coughs> I apologize if you said that and I got distracted, but do you mention the prime size? And yes. can you discuss a little bit what type of constraints do we have on the prime? Which is okay, so we found that uh, an easy way to to get a field well, easy way to get a, a correct field size was that the the order of the field minus one should be a large multiple, I mean, yeah, a multiple of a large power of two. <laughs> so this, I mean, so finding a prime that satisfies this uh, is really, is really a constraint. So basically because you want the multiplicative group to be... Yes, that there's, of yes, there's a reason for that. So basically the number of steps of your computation must be uh, divisible by that number and normally you will have a power of two number of steps, so that's why. Uh, but they also have this other version, uh, which is binary fields. So instead of having like prime prime order fields, they, they also have a version working with uh, powers of two uh, fields. And that's a more interesting approach, I guess, because the, the sizes are not so restricted, let's say. The, the High to also applies to the pairing-based stuff as well. Right. Okay, I guess that the Friday and egg will never be the same again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anais. Pleasure. <laughs>